I cannot live another day without air conditioning. It says tomorrow's gonna be hotter. Hotter? Like yesterday. Yesterday? Yesterday you said you'd call Sears. I'll call today. You call now. Hello, hello. It is your Chapo. It's uh, me, Will, here. Uh, joining me are Matt, Felix, and Amber. And we are all devising uh, various strategies of coping with an absolutely sweltering heat wave that is ravaging the East Coast of the United States right now. Guys, Amber, how are you beating the heat? Uh, I'm staying in my apartment and sitting in front of the air conditioning and um, using blackout curtains on the windows and just trying to hydrate and um, beating back the hordes of people trying to break in because uh, because they're bursting into flames. Well, uh, New York City is experiencing rolling blackouts uh, in a killer heat wave. Uh, let's just uh, let's try to stay cool, people. And let's bring some send some cool vibes, cool energies to, you know, anyone who is without air conditioning or, you know, just baking. Drink um, lots of water. Buy, buy streets. people water, too, by the way. Um, I mean, I would, homeless people die this time of year more than they do in the winter. I'd like to get something on the record just at the beginning of the show. Like I said, um, brutal heat wave going right now. And I've been seeing a lot of people say, oh, uh, New York City um, is not the hottest summer in the world. And I'd just like to say you're wrong. There is no city with a hotter summer than New York City. There's also no other city where people are tougher or classier than New York City. In no other city in the world will you find people in this kind of heat just going about their day, going to work, <laughs> doing stuff, having, making friends, talking to each other. Nowhere else in the world can you find that. And a lot of people have been saying, oh, oh, why don't you come to Dallas sometime? And I'm like, uh, I'll been, never go to Dallas. Been I will there. never go to Dallas. <laughs> been there, done that. New York City's hotter. Oh, yeah. come, come to Atlanta. Yeah. No. Yeah. It's not as hot I mean, as New York. I, I fuck like. New Yorkers are just like some of the lowest people in the world, but uh, <laughs> you know they're higher than Texans. Absolutely. Texans brag. Texans brag about how hot it is, and they literally there are tiny little AC units in the big pants that they wear, <laughs> the big hats. They're fucking pussies. They're inside like a hundred and seven percent of the year. And they're just like, y'all can throw an egg down in our driveway and fry it up. And it, it's, you know, I'm sick of it. I'm sick of it. New Yorkers may, you know, cause fake trend pieces uh, in their in their various publications that are headquartered here because they get nervous in conversation and just lie and say things like, oh, there's actually a really cool uh, post-rock scene in Sarasota, Florida, uh, <laughs> because they were just so afraid of dead space in the conversation. And every moment of their life is just nerve-wracking, anxiety-inducing social climbing, and they're the most erotic people in the world. But, you know, they're better than Texans, who uh, just literally live like the people in Wally, e and, uh, <laughs> you know, somehow fucking find a way to brag about how tough they are. Um, I'm also going to go on record and say uh, there is no place on Earth, certainly no city, that has a colder winter than New York City as well. Nowhere. Hottest summer, coldest winter, um, most temperate fall and spring months. And I do not want to argue about this. So don't try. I, I will say this. Like, the thing about, uh, like, New York extreme weather is that we're not prepared for any of it. And that's why it sucks more. Like, I'm from Indiana, which has basically the same very extreme highs and lows. But I don't know. We're prepared. Like, we know when weather happens. Every year, like, the infrastructure just crumbles under the weight of every winter and every summer. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and disagree with you, Amber, and say that there's no city, state, or country on the planet that's more prepared for extreme weather than <laughs> New York City. Okay? No, it's true. It's tr Yeah, it's true. Like, New York, when it gets hot, like, the Bodangles, they drag out their coldest dust and sprinkle the store in it <laughs> to keep all the food cool. They put... They... Uh, they all put their bodega cats in the freezer and then like, <laughs> walk around the store to cool the customers. Uh, you know, the garbage that marinates on the sidewalk, it's probiotic. 
<laughs> it's just wafting. It's wafting into the air, and it's like a vaccine against Ebola or whatever. And you know, like I said, you could you could try to argue that there are cities that have hotter and or colder and or more temperate climates in New York City. But what I'd say to you is count the rings, baby. That's twenty seven <laughs> world championships. Derek Jeter, the captain, number two. Um, well, uh, Amber, you are uh, you are joining us uh, again back from a you know I would say a slightly more temperate climate than uh, New York City, but oh like not God, in not in the classy or tough sense of it, just like in pure numbers. <laughs> you were in once again. Uh, the North remembers you were you were yeah. uh, you were upstate, shall we say? <laughs> yeah, I was upstate. Um, I went to the Durham Miners Gala actually for the second time, uh, which is uh, the largest uh, labor union uh, sort of festival or event in the world, um, which is very weird because there aren't any miners anymore. Um, uh, it's actually, I don't know if I actually formally announced this on the show, but this is uh, for my book. I, I have a book deal. What? Yeah, yeah. Uh, for St. Martin's Press, I'm writing um, a book about the uh, rise of social democratic politics uh, post Reagan Thatcher. So, um, you know, it's, it's a lot of uh, drinking stories. It's mostly just alcoholism, um, but, you know, with politics. So uh, how, how are things at the Miners Gala? What was the most gala event you attended? Um, he, well, I, I started drinking at 10. We got rained on. Um, because it rains there, it, it do be like that. I would kill for some of that. Oh my god, it's amazing and chilly, and everyone's like, "Oh, this is, this is oh no, too bad it rained." And I'm like, "I'm so happy to be in this rather." Um, but it's really celebratory, and you get to see all these sort of trade unionists uh, give like rousing speeches. Then you, you know, the, the absolute boy was our yes, was our boy there? Of course, of course. And then you always have like these. Um, just wonderful Northern English people, just like the best people in the world. Just mink scallywags. Oh my God. Just like, you know, girls with fake town and I fake tan and eyebrows that will just like cut you with car keys. Um, like they're just, they're, they're just like, you know, Tony Blair never showed up to this. Like every time you hear about how he never showed up and, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's all about sort of like celebration and history, but also looking forward because for a long time, the busting of the uh, miners' union during the 84-85 strike uh, in the UK is, um, other than the fall of like the Soviet Union, probably the biggest nail in the coffin and, um, you know, the sort of Cold War anti-socialist politics. Um, so you and the, the miners' gala are essentially trying to uh, sort of Dr. Frankenstein this thing back into life right now? <laughs> yeah, me personally. Yeah. Uh, no, but the thing is they've had like record numbers again since, uh, since like labor has gone left. People are excited about um, the Labor Party again. They're still excited about Corbyn. Um, and people are sort of trying to get back to remember like a, a militant trade unionism. So it's, it's very exciting. And also it's like the best kind of uh, English event where people are just really happy and comradely and joyous and wasted, just wasted. Um, so yeah, be on the lookout for uh, Amber's uh, book on just this topic. Uh, working title, it's gone up the apples and pears, mate. <laughs> Can you ruddy believe it? <laughs> Um, but uh, just to, to kick off the things on the show today, I'd like to um, return to a bit of local news. And by local, I mean here in the uh, hottest, classiest, classiest, toughest city in the world, New York City. And uh, this story comes to us courtesy of Staten Island. And I would like to check in now on um, a certain event and, uh, you know, individual who I'm, again, firmly convinced the show has willed into being. And that, of course, is the QAnon-obsessed weirdo who ended up killing one of the heads of the New York Five families in Staten Island. And wouldn't you know it, um, now that uh, it's sort of gone to trial, we are beginning to uh, peer behind the curtain of just what inspired such an event to take place. And, you know, take it with a grain of salt because this does come courtesy of his defense lawyer. But it is a pretty amazing story, straight out of the Chapo mindset, nonetheless. So this comes courtesy of the New York Times uh, headline. He wasn't seeking to kill a mob boss. He was trying to help Trump, his lawyer says. In new court documents, the lawyer for Anthony Camello says he became obsessed by far-right QAnon conspiracy theories. So it says here, 
Court documents filed on Friday offered a glimpse into the deeply troubled mind of Mr. Camello, who's, who his defense lawyer says was so deluded by internet conspiracy theories that he was determined to conduct a citizen's arrest of Mr. Cali and turn the mafia leader over to the military. That Now, this is, of course, uh, Francisco Frankie Boy Cali, who is the reputed leader of the Gambino crime family. And uh, Mr. Camello described here as an aimless young man who lived with his parents on Staten Island. That's everyone who lives in Staten Island. Going on here, it says he ardently believed that Frances Francesco Cali, a boss in the Gambino crime family, was a prominent member of the deep state and accordingly an appropriate target for a citizen's arrest, wrote Mr. Camillo's lawyer, Robert C. Gottlieb. So I love the idea of trying to put a member of the Gambino crime family under citizen's arrest, not for being in the mafia, but for being in the deep state. Yeah. Why not? Yeah, that, I mean, if people forget, like one of the biggest storylines in season one of The Sopranos was when uh, Christopher well, Multisante and uh, Brandon Fallone stole Junior's truck full of adrenochrome. <laughs> <laughs> um, going on here, it says Mr. Cowley's murder was the highest profile mob killing in decades, an event so significant that in the days between Mr. Cowley's death and Mr. Camello's arrest, speculation surged that a new war was brewing among the New York's five mafia families. Now, for those of you who uh, don't remember, the five mafia families are Brooklyn, <laughs> Queens, <laughs> Manhattan, <laughs> Staten Island, the Bronx. You put them all five together, you got the hottest, coldest city in the world. <laughs> That's New York, baby. But um, it says here, the reality, according to his lawyer, appears to be even more bizarre. Mr. Camello had become convinced that Mr. Cowley was part of the so-called deep state, a cabal of criminals that conspiracy theorists claim controlled the United States government. Mr. Camello also believed that he was a chosen vigilante of President Trump. Mr. Camello became certain that he was enjoying the protection of President Trump himself and that he had the president's full support, Mr. Gottlieb wrote. Wow. Now... You know, uh, I guess the theme for today's show would be um, a little bit of knowledge and truth is a dangerous thing um, mm -hmm. in the hands and minds of an idiot. And I like that the um, the sort of mafia deep state connection thing, because like, I guess there's a grain. I mean, the mafia has collaborated with U.S. intelligence and law enforcement before. Oh, Operation Gladio. <laughs> Not uh, kidding. P2 Masonic Lodge. Uh, the, the pizza connection. Uh, well, the French connection. <laughs> I can't know. These are real things. These are all the real, yeah. Yes. yeah. The the mob helped uh, keep the communists out of power in Italy after uh, World War II. Uh, specifically in America, though, in New York, it was Lucky Luciano, the, the famous deal to like keep the, the New York ports safe from Nazi U-boats, yep. which was really the cover story, to, which meant keep them safe from any kind of union agitation or left-wing organizing. Yeah, the same guys who broke the strikes in Marseille in France after World War II again were the guys who did the French Connection uh, heroin dealing. This is just sort of the theme of our era. Like, all of this stuff is real. Everyone just gets, like, the details completely wrong. Like... Pizzagate's definitely real. It's just not in comic ping pong. Right. This is my favorite part of the story here. It says, um, Mr. Camello took handcuffs with him <laughs> to Todd Hill on, <laughs> on March 13th. Mr. Gottlieb said, but his plan was foiled when Mr. Cowley refused to submit to a citizen's arrest. I, just, well, I did not plan for this, I gotta tell you. Uh, just to be frank, no like I, I thought that you, the mob boss, would take my authority as a guy wearing sweatpants uh, to come with me to the military police office. Oh, this fucking guy is asking for a letter of Mark. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, uh, yeah. Uh, um, uh, Mr. Cowley was completely stitched up when um, uh, he noticed that uh, there was an admiralty flag hanging outside his house. <laughs> but it says here, uh, instead, Mr. Gottlieb said, the Gambino leader reached toward his waistband. Fearing for his life, Mr. Camello shot Mr. Cowley 10 times and fled. QAnon, a baseless conspiracy theory. By the way, that's uh, needless All editorializing right. yeah, by is, the New York Times. Yeah, this is biased reporting. <laughs> that originated on Internet Message Board played a key role in Mr. Camello's descent into mental instability, his lawyer said. That's more, more editorializing. Yeah. It claims, among other things, that... America is controlled by a deep state that prominent Democratic politicians are pedophiles. I mean, it yeah. claims that. <laughs> 
uh, parts. And that John F. Kennedy Jr., who died in a 1999 plane crash, is secretly alive and will run for president in 2020. Okay, well, two out of three. I don't know. I mean, Matt, someone showed us they did the face app of John F. Kennedy Jr. And, dude, it's real. Yeah, it looks just like Vincent Fuchsia. So it goes, uh, driven by that obsession, Mr. Gottlieb said, Mr. Camillo began early this year to attempt citizens' arrests of people he believed to be associated with the deep state. In February, Mr. Camello twice tried to conduct his own arrest of Mayor Bill de Blasio, including one instance in which he showed up at Gracie Mansion, the mayoral home in Manhattan. Not long after that incident, Mr. Camello sought the help of United States Marshals at Federal District Court in Manhattan and asked them to help him arrest two California Democrats, Representatives Maxine Waters and Adam Schiff, both of whom he believed were in the vicinity. He was rebuffed. This is the best never made episode of Justified that I have right. yet encountered. <laughs> Just, uh, you know, Mr. Camello approaching Raylan Givens <laughs> and asking him to arrest Maxine Waters. Yeah. I love that. Raylan <laughs> Givens, uh, like Maxine Waters, is holding a baby and squeezing it like a free son. <laughs> <laughs> and Raylan is like, now down in the holler, some, some of the folks make their own adrenochrome. <laughs> they think it makes them faster, but I guarantee you I will put this bullet through your head. Before I'm you take one more sip of that baby. <laughs> I'm imagining uh, Raylan finding out that his uh, shitbag father was involved in the adrenochrome trade. He's like, <laughs> yeah. We're not, not. He's like, Raylan, that's just what we did back in the day. <laughs> <laughs> so it goes here. Uh, Mr. Gottlieb identified once one of Mr. Camello's accounts. Real America's voice underscore on Instagram in his filing. The page has dozens of memes and written screeds. Some are difficult to decipher. I mean, yeah, if you don't take the fucking time to read the proofs and understand it, uh, including uh, several posted days before Mr. Cowley's death. One post accuses Speaker Nancy Pelosi, Democrat of California, of being a fascist. Patriot sleeper cells are awake, he wrote in another. Yet another refers to Bill and Hillary Clinton as the Clinton crime family. But Mr. Gottlieb said he believed Mr. Camello had encountered posts online that suggested that mafia figures like Mr. Cowley were connected to the deep state. Mr. Gottlieb said on Saturday that he was sifting through thousands and thousands of messages and posts and forums that said Mr. Camello, he said Mr. Camello might have engaged with. So this is a, um, a bold uh, posting defense by defense attorney Mr. Gottlieb. Just a bit of an update on, you know, the head of one of New York City's five families uh, murdered uh, by someone who believed he was putting him under citizen's arrest at the personal behest of Donald Trump. So, well, Not how he thought he was going to go, I can guess. I, my, the best part is that he thought, like, imagine looking at Donald Trump and being like, this guy's got my back. The thing is, like, I feel bad for this guy because he's going to get a really bad sentence because he's going to get a hate crime modification on his conviction. Uh, for doing tropes by saying that the mob boss was a reptilian, <laughs> making it an anti-Semitic hate crime. I like the how his ambitions just sort of shrank. At first, he's like, I'm going to personally arrest the mayor. Yeah. Then I'm going to, I guess, get a couple of U.S. Marshals to help me go across the country to arrest some California congressmen. And then when he realizes that that's out of his purview, he's like, well, there's a guy down the block who's kind of <laughs> yeah, involved yeah. in some shit. I'll just go arrest him. I don't, yeah, have to go so, over, I don't have to pay for the toll to go over the bridge. <laughs> it's, so, it's so Staten Island guy. Just like, yeah, it turns out I actually live next door to uh, one of the international immortal pedophiles. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Staten Island is the best borough in the world because, you know, you can... Uh, you can meet a uh, immortal, uh, immortal uh, uh, fallen angel uh, from the forbidden ninth planet Nibiru, and uh, he's actually just another fat Italian guy who looks just like you. You don't have to go anywhere. Most convenient borough in the world, and you get to drink on the ferry. We got the best pizza. We got the best pedophiles, baby. Number one, Staten Island. Did I ever tell you guys my Staten Island ferry story? No. What is it? No. I just like it's not even really a story. It's like me and Nick just decided to, you know, because it's like a nice like ride, uh, you know, and it was like a late shift thing. So like a bunch of, you know, guys in like work suits were in there. And uh, one guy, he pulls out like a plastic, plastic uh, bag and he sets it on his lap. And then he pulls out uh, one of those like one quart Ziploc bags and it's full of 
pasta and red sauce. <laughs> And he just eating it out of the bag. <laughs> I mean, better, better, better to do that on a ferry than, let's say, like on a closed subway car or airplane. You know? I guess, it's but that- it's not like it's a smooth ride. Half the time, that ferry runs into a wall <laughs> in the water. <laughs> uh, Matt, as our resident Q watcher, this one's for you. Uh, I've never heard of the Gambinos or Mafia at all related to Q, other than this particular guy. Is no, it, is I, it I, just something either. a total invention it's totally of this? Cra- I mean, I think that there. If you go into it, I'm sure. I mean, there's a million posts. And there's only a few of them are actually Q. The rest of them are people like commenting on them. You know, like medieval scribes or something. <laughs> but I think people just sort of riff, and people riff on what's close to them. So if you're a Q guy in Staten Island, it's like, hey, you know, the guy Maybe down the, the block, he's, he's got to be involved. Yeah, I assume it's at this point like a kind of thing where I could just pull any name that more than 10 people would know. I like, I don't know, like Nick Jonas and go in there and be like, oh, yeah, Nick Jonas is totally involved in Q somewhere deep in the forum post. Oh, yeah. And like, I'm sure that Nick Jonas is a white hat. <laughs> I'm sure that if you go to any town in this country of, of, of a large enough size, like some local, like, like the guy who does the commercials for like discount electronics there's people who've decided that he's involved in Q because they see him on TV all the time. We should protect Bob from Bob's furniture. <laughs> I mean, he's got to be next. We're more, we're play, we're again. <laughs> I think, um, I mean, like, but this just like, it just goes to show that like, you know, the sort of like nature of psychotic delusion isn't to be divined very, uh, like literally, like basically when you get sort of that stream of crazy, you just get a very sticky brain and, Things just stick to it. It's like a ball of tape rolling around on the ground, just picking up whatever's in the vicinity. Uh, once again, I'm going to have to disagree with you, Amber, and say that the nature of psychotic delusion is to be studied intensely and shared. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully, by We're gonna a, read them tea by leaves. A, a podcasting uh, medium. No, I like the idea of uh, Bob from Bob's Furniture. He's a black hat. Absolutely. Going after him on the case is the general from the auto insurance general. <laughs> and she, the beautiful, handsome auto insurance general is a white hat who's taking down Bob from Bob's Furniture and Crazy Eddie. My prices are so low, you'll think I'm a pedophile! <laughs> and the most, uh, you know, internationally connected, high power, you know, fixer type lawyers for the pedophiles, uh, Salino and Barnes. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I'm going to be brought up uh, Mayor Mayor De Bungler, who you know managed to evade citizens' arrest thus far for his connections to the uh, deep state uh, conspiracy. However, I would like to propose him as a candidate for citizens' arrest for um, canceling this weekend's Aussie Fest in Central Park, thus robbing you, our dear listeners, from yet another report from the front lines of American insanity by your very hot. Sweaty boy, Matt Christman. Yeah, what the hell? I was I was so excited about just getting sunstroke while listening to Malcolm Gladwell so that slowly over the course of the conversation, it made more and more sense <laughs> as my pores just clogged up and I stopped sweating and I reached a 105 degree body temperature. <laughs> my brain turned into fucking oatmeal. Uh, but no, can you can you believe it? This weekend's Aussie Fest was literally canceled due to the quote unquote heat emergency. Yeah, not at all because Mayor de Bunglero f- fears the char- the charisma of John Kasich in common. <laughs> <laughs> well, Beto was going to be there, so that's a guy who's competing with the Bo- the Blasio for votes. So, I mean, follow follow the money. Uh, yeah, this is a hatch act violation if I've ever seen one. I don't know what that is, but it definitely stinks. <laughs> It was funny because it reminds me that last year, a year ago, I was uh, sweating my ass off listening to Steve Pinker uh, say in his on his panel of of entrepreneurs about how the future is going to be better than now because of science and technology. And somebody said, hey, what about global warming? And they're like, well, yes, that's a challenge, but I think we're up to the up to it year later yeah no it's five thousand degrees in new york in in central park if you stood there for more than five minutes you would literally die yeah but it probably has more to do with the fact that like half the speakers were on the flight logs <laughs> <laughs> i mean i think he shut it down a to silence beto and b there's nothing that the ruling class and the elites fear more then both sides coming together for, to form bipartisan <laughs> common sense solutions to our problems that, you know, sort of turn down the dial on political bickering and turn it up on uh, political conversation. 
Yeah, I mean, this is sort of like the French Revolution meets 1984 all over again. Uh, <laughs> because, you know how in V for Vendetta, they wouldn't less, let them like listen to music because it would like inspire them and like, you know, to make them rise up. Same thing with Equilibrium, another classic by George Orwell. Uh, <laughs> so, like, imagine if the downtrodden population of New York, you know, just to give a sample lineup of Ozzy Fest, got to first listen, hear the Foo Fighters, and then watch a speech by Asa Hutchinson. <laughs> they would it would be the most emotion they ever felt in their lives. That's like mm. the highest in both like government and public service and art. And it would have been like the end of V for Vendetta, where everyone puts on the anonymous mask and uh, DDoS is the government's website, I think. And so they have to leave. See, I was thinking uh, like their fear would be that it would be like the end of do the right thing, but with a bunch of like progressive libs. (laughs) (laughs) And you know what? I don't even really have a joke for it. I just like thinking about it in my head. I I love it. I love that. They're just like, you have to put a picture of Bill Maher up on your wall. <laughs> yeah. See, I'm just going to do the, the, do the setup and, and let Felix just like land the, land the uh, punchlines on that one. It just, it tickles me. Throwing a garbage can through like the, uh, the window of uh, the Fox and friends studio. <laughs> <laughs> so since they canceled it, I, I, in order to simulate the experience, I just put on a Tom Friedman audio book and was in a bathtub covered myself with fully turned on air dryer uh hair dryers and just baked myself like a fucking uh what do you call it baked thing no, no. <laughs> potato <laughs> <laughs> it's hot folks. it's so hot it's fucking hot it's so hot you know you don't realize i mean again uh, uh another it's another, never been hotter anywhere else it's never been hotter anywhere else on the planet than in new york city right here right now uh but um yeah and, you know, and th- th- here's another topic that came up this week that I'm glad is finally people are shedding some light on. And that's um, how damn hard it is to do a podcast. Like, do you people know that, like, we can't I can't even have AC on in my apartment when we're recording this because you complain about the ambient noise? Like, I walked like three blocks to Will's apartment. It's hell. Edit that out. I don't, I don't want people, um, you know, reverse engineering our, our geolocation tags <laughs> through God. Google Maps. Um, all right. Well. Uh, Ozzy Fest uh, was canceled, but uh, this earlier this week there was another uh, political conference going on that I think uh, bears discussion. This, of course, is the um, something called the uh, National Conservatism Conference that was hosted in uh, D.C. and basically. You know, uh, Tucker Carlson spoke there. Uh, I'm going to, in a little bit, I'm going to read you from uh, Senator Josh Hawley's remarks. But essentially, this is um, a kind of, uh, it was put on by the Edmund Burke Society, which is just a brand new uh, font of, I don't know, demonic thought and enterprise that is, uh, you know, know, something to sort of like, rebrand the conservative movement in the era of Trump because like you know this is something we've talked about like the fact that he got elected was like a a major shock to the uh you know institutions that normally govern uh, the conservative the agenda guard, yeah yeah the fact that he got elected after saying things like uh you know the Iraq war was a disaster and we never should have done it he made i would say insincere but at least um you know gestured at the idea that uh people's health insurance is inadequate and, you know, they, they would, would like something better or jobs. I mean, again, like these, these are, you know, Trump doesn't actually believe in any of these things and he is thus far governed pretty much exactly like Marco Rubio or Jeb Bush would have done, save for some of the trade stuff he's done, which I think is really like his only real signature point of divergence from the rest of the, the field. But to Kinda, that- yeah, but I, I do think like, uh, I mean, like he literally got bored with Venezuela and it was like, I'm bored and it's hard. So yeah. I, I do think like in terms of foreign policy, it's trade and foreign yeah. policy. But like, yeah. but here's the thing, though, is like these people are the, the, at the what we saw at the National Conservatism Conference is like these people are incubating the next Trumps who will take, you know, pick up the ball that, you know, he is, you know, uh, moving downfield. In he terms can't of, be recreated, though. Well, the, the thing is, like, but it's going to be someone who uh, like we've talked about Tom Cotton and now this Josh Hawley guy. 
who are going to take like the sort of template and and use it in a way that's even more uh, cynical or you know better prepared or at least do, do have done the homework or whatever. So the idea here is that conservatism is trying to grapple with the fact that the sort of free market bromides about you know uh, the market, business, growth, entrepreneurship aren't exactly cutting it to the average Republican voter anymore. They want something else, and they're beginning to. Um, sort of grope around this idea that, you know, perhaps free markets aren't going to give us the goods that we really want. Mm. And the goods that they really want in this case is essentially a, you know, a, a culture and politics dominated by white conservative Christians. And that, you know, every time Nike, you know, gives Kaepernick an endorsement or that there is a, you know, gay couple in a serial commercial, they, you know, they are blaming that essentially on, uh, that the forces of capitalism have uh, conspired against them and it has uh, sort of pushed further out of their grasp the, the restoration of an America that they would like to live in and that they, in which people like them are respected and, you know, uh, admired once yeah, there's again. A, there's a split on the right. You know, I, I don't know how distinct it is, but there, there's definitely a split between, like, cultural conservatives, like serious actual conservative like freaks and like free market capitalist guys i mean like neoliberalism is proving kind of unwieldy for the right and that's really strange because like in other countries these would be two parties yeah like i mean they'd both be monsters but for different reasons well i mean this is sort of like um you know the staten island q guy is that, like I said, like, there's nothing like, more dangerous than an idiot who has figured out one thing that's like kind of true. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think we should be, you know, concerned with the fact that the right wing is beginning to glom on, no matter how um, insincerely, to this I the correct idea that is naturally felt by the vast majority of people in this country that the uh, the people at the commanding heights of our economy, politics, and culture. Uh, essentially don't give a fuck about the vast majority of people and that, for lack of a better term, the Washington consensus or neoliberalism has deeply, you know, fractured, failed and, you know, gutted large swaths of this country. So they're beginning to, uh, to, to grope at that message. But, you know, what they're offering in return, at least as evidenced by this uh, conference, is, I think, a kind of nascent, more fully articulated than Donald Trump's kind of blood and soil nationalism. I think what we used to say about Tom Cotton, who I think is sort of proved by now, he's not like quite ready for prime time. He's just a little too off putting for people. He's a little too, even just a totally uninitiated person will look at him and, you know, see dead zone. But, uh, how, how, however you say his name, Holy, uh, Holy. Yeah. Holy. Uh, is he has to be the most terrifying Republican senator because he's very young and he's you the know, youngest senator in, in office right now. Right. And, you know, if you were going to ask this ridiculous hypothetical a few years ago, what would a competent Trump look like? You would be describing him. He's perfect for that. Like he's he's Trump with a coherent wor worldview. I mean, not co right. Not coherent in the sense that it's, you know, consistent uh sort of consistent in its enemies and the reasons it picks its enemies like he's anti-big tech mostly because you know they silence conservative uncles on there mm -hmm. but uh he has a know, camp he's, like he's a trump that wouldn't give up so easily but that's why it wouldn't won't work though because trump's whole thing is that he has no camp and like that was his appeal to, you know, so many people. I don't think that you can. I think he's a shooting star, a big, dumb, cruel shooting star. I, I do worry about the right, uh, you know, the populist right picking up on just very basic, um, you know, capitalist critiques, because historically that's a that's a real uh, powder keg there. Yeah. Well, yeah. The problem is, is, is that for them, as Amber says, is that he doesn't have Trump doesn't have a base. He was able to overcome the entire architecture of the party by being rich and famous independently, and so he could make his own agenda. Regular, uh, uh, regular Republicans don't have that ability. So what they're mm -hmm. trying to do is rhetorically latch on to the Trump critique, 
which is getting deepened as culture wars get more frenzied as everyone loses their mind because of the reality of Trump being president. But they can't put anything beyond, behind it. Like, look at Hawley. Hawley's actual uh, policies are all big business Republican shit. He's in fa- against raising the minimum wage. He's against any kind of extension of, med- med- medical, uh, uh, of, of medical insurance. Uh, he's against, he's a fucking for uh, uh, he's against unions. He he was for the right to work thing that got crushed in in Missouri. Uh, well, how the hell are you going to make any kind of coherent argument where you are the right populist opponent to capitalism while uh, demonizing labor unions and uh, and supporting deregulation and tax cuts, which he's also in favor of, that all bound rebound to the benefit of these people. Why? And, and, and he has to do that because he gets the same checks from the same billionaires as the rest of the Republicans. He's a fucking coke boy <laughs> like the rest of these guys. They are they are limited in a way that Trump never was uh, by the, the, the architecture of the Republican Party. And that is why, as scary as it is to imagine somebody becoming the competent Trump, there are a lot of structural problems. There are a lot of structural things inhibiting that from happening. The next... Uh, a Trump type figure would have to have an independent base like Trump did. He would have to be able to split up the coalition meaningfully. And to do that, he would have to not be holded to the party as it exists. Well, and there's nobody like that on the horizon. Thank God. Uh, how successful this attempt to sort of retrofit a new intellectual conservative agenda onto Trumpism will be uh, remains to be seen, but I think it bears uh, paying close attention to uh, regardless. And I think that what we should do is now go in to Senator Josh Hawley's uh, much celebrated uh, remarks and speech here at the uh, National Conservatism Conference. And Matt, I think you get you hit the nail directly on the head. Uh, I read this speech and essentially like what you know, what he do is, does with this is try to um, you know, build up the, you know, the forgotten American, the, you know, the middle class family who's experiencing uh, drug addiction or divorce or, you know, lack of uh, stable communities and uh, dignified employment and, you know, bl- potentially blame putting uh, laying the blame for that uh, both rightly and wrongly at the feet of elites. But you'll notice what he doesn't mention is anything to do with, as you rightly pointed out, Matt, uh, labor unions. Right. So, like, I mean, like how you could even begin to have a conversation about how to bring back the kind of stable communities and families of the for the type of people or for any to any person in this country that these people are grasping at without talking about labor or union power is just insane. And of course, he never will or because, you know, he's a he's a ghoul straight out of, the, you know, Yale Law School, Stanford and some bizarre British public like, you know, and private he's still school. completely beholden to the institutions. So, yeah. I, yeah, but I mean, like at the at the same time, Americans don't instinctually connect, you know, sort of this type of uh, this type of populism to being pro union to being a lot of things. There isn't like unions have been so systematically destroyed in the past few decades that no one's no the average person is not going to sort of be able to point out that inconsistency. I mean, uh, Holly Holly is like. He's just sort of like if Tucker Carlson was a senator and Tucker has similarly incoherent views in that respect in that he's sort of he sort of spent like his entire life in the care of these billionaire right wing organizations and uh, policy apparatuses. How about in the family of a billionaire right wing organization? Right. Exactly. Well, yeah, exactly. Comes from an elite background. But like people don't make the connection. People aren't even people don't even realize they're poor. People don't even realize they're not I, doing well. Yeah. Well, yeah, but you don't, need, to, you don't like, need people to make the connection. You need a political movement to make the connection, which is why this whole thing is only scary if the Democratic Party is the Democratic Party and doesn't change. I, I think people know they're not doing well. I would push back a little bit on that. I, I don't think they necessarily, um, you know, have like a, like a coherent worldview of why that is. But like when you sort of look at, I mean, you know, take it with a grain of salt, but polling with people generally sort of understand uh, when they're struggling. Um, there is definitely a, um, you know, kind of like a, a weird American sense of like, well, you know, I got steady work, I do all right, and it's like you are living paycheck to paycheck. Like, But at mm-hmm. the same time, if you were to ask them, like, how do you think Americans are doing, where they don't have to sort of like talk about themselves, they would be like, people are suffering. 
yeah, I think that's a that's a good distinction. But uh, like speaking to this this issue of you know like uh, uh, not being able to link up the inconsistencies in this or within within your own life and our uh, political vision, I think speaks to how uh, ruthlessly efficient uh, this like, you know people have been at um, conflating class with culture war or cultural signifiers. Yeah, because like you know in 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 the view of Holly and the people at this conference. If you are like, let's say, like a barista who like lives and works in an urban center and has like you know purple hair and you know is uh, pursuing a, I don't know a graduate degree in a major American city, you are more of an elite than the you know ski do dealership suburban fuckwad in middle America, or even right, a, like an oil company class. executive. Yeah, or, is less of an elite than that person in this class. rubric. And, and, but also that there's a there's like a double um, kind of problem with that, too, is that like, you know, the, the, the struggling grad student, young people and this especially like middle class young people don't notice when they're downwardly mobile. They tend to think of their situation as being very temporary. Uh, the number of people I have been in grad school who think they're going to get tenure is astounding. I don't know what they're putting in the Kool-Aid in these higher institutions of learning or whatever, but it is actually kind of insane. Um, so there's kind of an extra hump uh, to class consciousness with like people with liberal arts degrees who are like under 35. They're sort of oblivious and, and they kind of believe they're going to be an exception. Like, you know, it's like the temporarily embarrassed millionaire, except that like, you know, I say for millennials, they believe that they're temporarily embarrassed uh, tenured professors well let, let's go to the tape to uh holly's own words here and see if we can um you know suss out uh any any more uh, meaning about where this is going so I've, I've just have a few highlights here he says here the great divide of our time is not between trump supporters and trump opponents or between suburban voters and rural ones or between red america and blue america no the great divide of our time is between the political agenda and lead of the leadership elite and the great and broad middle of our society. And the answer what? to the answer and to answer the discontent of our time, we must end that divide. We must forge a new consensus. The broad middle So there is the there is the agenda of a political elite. Uh -huh. She is laying Notice he said the agenda, not not he didn't even go so far as to say the divide is between the elites. He said, well their agenda. You see, he's laying uh, the blame for this at the agenda of political elites, of which he identifies of, you know, being sort of both parties, a kind mm -hmm. of Washington consensus. And then there is the great and broad middle of our society, and that that is the real uh, division in contemporary politics. It's sort of like a, a remix of Barack Obama's, you know, there isn't a red America or a blue America. Right. He's saying that there is, you know, an elite cosmopolitan America and then everyone else. And that their agenda is almost strictly cultural right and their agenda also is independent of them the agenda has caused the conflict because of course obviously he doesn't want to completely burn bridges with like major capitalists and heads of state so he's yeah. like well it's, it's an agenda issue and by the way when he talks about the great and broad middle of our society i just like to point out that, that? that basically half of americans live in cities yeah it's just, just to point that out just keep that in mind as this goes on plenty of working class people live on the coasts so he goes, for years, the politics of both left and right have been informed by a political consensus. That Wait, does it, do you think he means middle geographically? Because he completely, he, he also... I like, think he means both. I think he's, I think, I think it's I think a, he's I think being a, as vague as fucking I think it's possible. a self-conscious conflation and, and vagueness that yeah. he's using to, to yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I smuggle in this very, yeah. like I said, hard right, blood and soil nationalism. Which he's, which by the way, like that, that is his antidote to the politics of the elite. Right. And we'll, we'll get to that. But he goes, says here... For years, the politics of both left and right have been informed by a political consensus that reflects the interests not of the American middle, but of a powerful upper class and their cosmopolitan priorities. This class lives in the United States, but they identify as citizens of the world. They run businesses or oversee universities here, but their primary loyalty is to the global community. Again, Just I like... Say I, I like <laughs> 
Well, I like that conflation of going from they run businesses globally and also oversee universities. Uh -huh. So it's like the conflation of like, you know, uh, the Goldman Sachs vulture capitalism and like university administrators yeah, right. as being like equally powerful or politically influential in pursuing a... You right, know, because they're trying to touch both bases, the root, culture yeah, and the... Yeah, a yeah. ruthless, like for instance, a ruthless policy of like deindustrialization and the creation of a global supply chain to undercut American labor after the hollowing out of unions. Mm -hmm. I mean, sure, there's a lot of blame to go around for that. But again, it's like it's the conflation of like the uh, yeah, the, someone who works in a city in a cultural industry and the heights of financial capitalism and politics or like Alan Greenspan, for you instance. Know what is, what's frustrating about this is like when you hear people keep trying to develop these like dichotomy, like, first of all, obviously Marx did it best. There are workers and they're capitalists and those that's the conflict. But it's like, you know, it's like that chapter in Moby Dick where he tries to do um, like a, he tries to like write about what kind of whales are in what family. Psychology. Yeah, he tries to do like the, the psychological. He's like, okay, first things first. I know one thing about whales. Whales are fish. And second thing, I don't know anything about whales and neither does anyone else. <laughs> and that's kind of like, it's, it's really frustrating. I mean, it's funny in Moby Dick because you're like, they're not fish. I learned that uh, on PBS as a child. But, like, it's strange watching someone sort of do, um, try to sort of create, a, a, like, a, a landscape or a, or, a, or, a, or, a, or a biome of, of politics that, like, doesn't exist. It's like, it's like hearing about humors or something. So he goes on here. He says, on economics, this consensus favors globalization. Closer and closer economic union, more immigration, more movement of capital, more trade on whatever terms. The boundaries between America and the rest of the world should fade and eventually vanish. The goal is to build a global consumer economy, one that will provide an endless supply of cheap goods, most of them made with cheap labor overseas and funded by American dollars. But it's about more than economics. According to the cosmopolitan consensus, globalization is a moral imperative. That's because our elites distrust patriotism and dislike the common culture left to us by our forebears. So again here, he's like a very vague and like intentionally misleading conflation of uh, the problems caused by globalization with this kind of cosmopolitan culture that just doesn't like apple pie and church. You know, and I'm so like, this is the thing. The vast majority of American culture nowadays, like the mainstream of American culture, has left these people by decades ago. Mm -hmm. And they're not going to get it back. So what they want here is sort of cultural dominance on their terms. And the thing is, We've spoken about this before. You can't stoke a nationalism without an internal enemy to stoke it against. And what they've done, what he's doing here, is very self-consciously conflating, like I said, the, the commanding heights of political and economic power in this country with sort of, I don't know, uh, he's, the, the he's white being vague, the white <laughs> grandchildren who uh, won't reply to your Facebook memes, right? Right. Because they, you know, listen to rap music and generally think that immigration is OK yeah. or have purple hair or a nose ring or something right. like that. The two poles of, of elites in the country, uh, Goldman Sachs executives and people who po are mad they won't let you post porn on Tumblr anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so he goes here. Uh, at the same time, it has encouraged multinational corporations to move jobs and assets overseas to chase the steepest wages and pay the lowest taxes. Wait, I mean, what? Sorry, I'm going back. What it has encouraged? What has encouraged? The, the sort of the, the cosmopolitan globalization consensus. Oh, that's a really interesting cart before the horse kind of thing. Like they, they had to be encouraged to leave America. And goes, they, like capital has no directives of its own. And like it says, oh, like and to chase the cheapest wages and pay the lowest taxes. You mean the agenda that you are essentially yeah. carrying out yes. here in America? Yes. You get it, you, you, do you really want to go back on that giant tax cut that they just passed, Josh? He goes, uh, just about any American worker without a four-year college degree will have a hard time in the cosmopolitan economy. Maybe that's one reason why marriage rates among working-class Americans are falling, why birth rates are falling, why life expectancy is falling. All the while, an epidemic of suicide and drug addiction ravages every sector, every age group, every geography of the working class. He's saying things that are true. This is like actually what is what is dangerous about this stuff is that someone is, is acknowledging that people are miserable. There is like suicide and drug addiction and people are having trouble forming relationships and starting families. I but mean, there's like, no, there's no solution to it. 
because it's not a problem of capitalism. It's right. a problem of the agenda of some special sector of capitalism, which is why he got nailed for being anti-Semitic. And I think that I don't really think he was trying to be anti-Semitic. I, I mean, I, at, but at the end of the day, if you're going to blame the, the the problems of capitalism that are endemic to it, that are built in, like that whole the the the, the, the conflict between traditional values and capitalism that's found that's built into capitalism. Marx talked about that. It, yeah. It's the ultimate destroyer of all traditions. It has to. It will, over time, destroy all traditions because nothing can stand in front of it. But if you will not point out capitalism as the issue, then you have to have some cabal of capitalists who have a specific agenda. And then well, you have right, to have an explanation for why. He like, can't what articulate is with them? The, the, the parameters of that cabal. Like He, he has no sense of... He can't say exactly who they are. So what he does is invoke, he, he does tropes. Right. Exactly. Like not even on purpose. And Because you, you, there's no other explanation. Yeah. You have nowhere else to go. If you've got capitalists who are mutating and manipulating the market in order to get the these crony cultural, capitalists. To get mm-hmm. these mm-hmm. cultural outcomes, how, why are they doing it? What, what, there has to be something different about them. It's like and, a- and that's why you have to say, well, they don't have patriotism. But, but like, well, why not? And that's why it always ends up turning to the Jews because the, there's a ready-made explanation that because they are considered to not be part of the nation, then of course that they want to destroy it. They're jealous of it. They can't be part of it. Uh, and, you know, it's like cosmopolitan capitalism is replacing crony capitalism as like the go-to uh, boogeyman for like why everything sucks. Right. And, right. you know, you haven't reaped any of the benefits of the supposedly great free market system that we live under. And I'll, I'll say, people, I'll, are, people are manipulating. Yeah. Capitalism. No, and I'll go, I'll go a step further. It's like, well, you know, I, I don't think it's like a, as nearly self-consciously evil as this guy. It's also, I'm sorry, the problem with like Elizabeth Warren's view of capitalism yep. is this idea that there are ethical and unethical capitalists and that you yeah. just need to like find the the ethical people and put them in charge because Matt you're exactly right it begs the question well like what what is it about the unethical capitalists like you know what is it is there but what is, it, is there something endemic to them personally is yeah. it something like it becomes, something it becomes a moral and virtue them. argument yeah. uh, it's like it's like a combination with with Warren it's a little different because she does love to talk about greed but also she's fundamentally a technocratic nerd so she's like it's like a twofold problem. One, you know, we we need uh, a good and virtuous man uh, driving the soul harvester, and <laughs> and two, like you know, uh, we need to you know maybe replace the brake pads on the soul harvester. <laughs> but uh, you know, here, here here's where he gets into um, the the meat of it. Here he says. The left champions multiculturalism and degrades our common identity. The right celebrates hyper-globalization and promises that the market will make everything right in the end, eventually, perhaps. In truth, neither political party has seen much interested in the American middle. There he goes again with that the phrase, the shit, American yeah. middle, for quite a By long way, time. By the way, this is something Democrats do, too, where they just won't shut the fuck up about the middle class, which is, again, a category with no parameters. They never say who that is. When they, when they tried to nail Bernie on you know, Medicare for all, they're like, will this raise taxes for the middle class? And I, I, I think he did a pretty good job but i think the better answer is who's the middle class like show me the middle class and when people talk about communities point to the community like what are you talking about like they don't they discuss these categories it, they, they they pick the vaguest categories possible um to get them out of one alienating like actual elites that they're going to need to win any election uh and two to sort of you know be a it's, it's like a horoscope you make things as vague as possible so people listen to it and they're like yeah that kind of sounds like the problems i have that kind that kind of sounds like you know what i what i uh suspect is happening going on here he says let's start with this america is not going to become the rest of the world and the rest of the world is not going to become america we are a unique nation with a unique history and unique purpose in the world Unique New York, <laughs> unique New York. But again, like so, like what what he's offering in lieu of you know, let's say you know the type of economy that would provide stability to that you know middle he keeps talking about is what he's giving them instead is a a, a mythic sense of purpose and destiny. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Where have I? Hmm. Yeah, yeah. I don't know that 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 rhymes with a certain part of history. Look, well, the the Rhine gives its gold to the sea. And he goes, that history began two thousand years ago. 
Oh, Jesus, shut the fuck God. up. Shut Athens up. and Jerusalem. Oh, oh, it's just free nerds. land. It's a bunch he's of land. Nerds. You kill the natives. You have a gun. They have a spear. You take it from them and you just give it to everybody. And it, and it, it gives you this great opportunity to just elide all of these conflicts within the society by just giving out the free land. And then guess what? The free land's gone. And now we're having a fucking gigantic nervous breakdown it's because there's no outlet anymore he goes it, that history began 2000 oh, years Jesus ago when the proud traditions of the self-governing city states met the radical claims of a jewish rabbi oh, who Jesus. taught that the call of god comes to every person and the power of god can work through each so that every human being has dignity and standing and can change the world and so the idea of the individual was born and our first forebearers brought that radical convic conviction to these shores and reshaped the Republican tradition. They built a new republic governed not by a select elite in the day, as in the days of old, but by the common man and woman, grounded on the premise that it is the common man and woman who are the noblest of citizens. Okay, I want to go through a couple things here. Uh, one, this whole idea, like, you know, that, that, that the problem that these people have with cosmopolitanism or liberalism or multiculturalism is that it too much exalts the individual and makes us all sort of these hyper atomized individuals yeah. who are all different from one another without any common culture or grounding. So, like, but yet, here he goes, like, what's so great about, you know, the Jerusalem Athens connections is that it invented the individual mm -hmm. and that our, our, the, our forebearers, you know, enshrined. You know the the primacy of that individual, you know, in our constitution and the Bible and fucking you know Plato and Aristotle or whatever. The reason they seem so ambivalent about collectivism, though, is that they know that they need collectivism to get any kind of a political movement going behind them. Obviously, when they win, collectivism is bad. It's like okay, y'all need to break up now. But like, it's like they understand there is a political utility to thinking about uh, you know us. But then you know when you're in power. Like, fuck that. You're all individuals. There aren't there is no society. There are only families, men and women. So, yeah. And then, and then also, you know, for, forget all this Jerusalem Athens bullshit. But he goes uh, that our, our 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 nation was founded by people who knew that Repub the republic should not be governed by a select elite and that the common man and woman were the noblest of citizens. That is 100 percent a historical absolute the, horseshit. The, the founding fathers loathed and feared the common man the and the people masses. are a great beast alexander hamilton just just leaving behind just we'll just pretend that like slavery wasn't wasn't a part of such a huge or that part of women were fully enfranchised yes, citizens exactly. as well forgetting that entirely just like you know reading the receipts like their opinion on the rabble was like disgust and fear that's why we have a senate that was, yeah. That's the tradition that they took from the classic era neither of antiquity. In the original constitution, neither the Senate nor the president were directly elected. Both of those things have been, over time, made yeah, to happen. To and universal yeah, suffrage, yeah. even for men, was not a thing. There were, there were land requirements in basically every state. So, continuing here, he says, uh, and, and that will require change. Because an economy driven by money changing on Wall Street ultimately benefits those who have the money to start with. And that economy will not support a great nation. I mean, fair enough, right, mm -hmm. Josh? What do you, what, okay, but like, continue. He goes, so we need to start thinking and new policies. We need to start thinking and new policies to bring the work that makes citizenship to every person in America willing and able to work. That means encouraging capital investment in the great American middle, in our workers, not just in financial assets. That means investing in research and innovation in the heartland of this country, not just in San Francisco and New York. That's the J.D. Vance thing, yeah, by yeah. the way. Who mm -hmm. Just put some incubators in and in, uh, sprinkle some incubators across yeah. the Rust Belt. Uh, J.D. Vance also spoke at this conference, by the way. Oh, of course. And he goes, yeah. that means challenging the economic concentration that stifles small producers and family enterprises. Small producers. Well, that is the real fundamental. I mean, this That's is harking back to the term, first the big split in the in uh in the republican party in the 50s between like the taft people and the eisenhowers over wall street and over uh you know shit like the un and the marshall plan like the, the original base for like the reactionary conservative movement that ended up co coalescing around goldwater were these middle american small uh small capitalists who felt like they were being screwed over by uh, an economy that was rigged around large capitalists but at the end of the day, that movement upward, that consolidation, that annihilation of, of 
of boutique firms and small mm -hmm. concerns, that's an inevitable byproduct yeah. of capital accumulation. The there is no reversing it in a capitalist yeah. context as you create a global market, which we have. The, like, the, he basically wants to create like a fucking uh, like an Epcot center of little <laughs> subsidized fake entrepreneurial outfits that are all just directly uh, propped up by global capital streams and are totally not viable on their own but just exist because they make us feel better. They make us feel like we're on um, Main Street USA. And, you know, like what he's talking about here is like, you know, in our lifetimes, we have seen in this country probably the greatest single upward transfer of wealth in human history from the hands of this so-called middle to, I don't know, five or six people. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know, I mean, I mean, that's an exaggeration, but well, like, that's about it. Like, I mean, like th this is seven a real or eight pedophiles <laughs> <laughs> i mean this is a real thing and he, he's right both the the left and the right such as the left exists in this country have largely presided over that same transfer of wealth it's happened under democratic presidents it's happened under republican ones it, it tends to be you know hypercharged under republican ones and then slightly papered over under democratic ones but essentially the you know the format still exists there right and, you know, so what, he, what he's saying here is like he's 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 diagnosing a problem, but like you will not hear the word profit or wealth discussed in this in terms of like who gets to reap the benefits of globalization, for instance. Like, you know, if we're going to have a globalized economy, how about you tax heavily the people who benefit the most from it and subsidize those who are, you know, uh, left out if we're going to have such a, you know, uh, if we're going to worship at Moloch's temple, you know, that could be one uh, arrangement. But you'll notice that that is, of course, perfectly elided by Hawley and the National Conservatism Conference. And the idea that, that you're ever going to be able to compete domestically with international uh, uh, labor that is vastly cheaper, that's just impossible. The, way, the only way to do that is to create the very kind of international institutions that he's so scared of, but use them to create international standards for labor. So really brave of them to come to out in favor of a new common uh, turn. Such dramatic uh, arbitrages. Uh, and also, that fucking internationalism is literally the only way we're all not going to die. I mean, period. Like, okay, we're going to be we're going to be fortress America. Is that going to stop the fucking oceans from rising? Is that going to stop uh, it from being 150 fucking degrees every day in the summer and the the Midwest from turning into a dust bowl? There's no way to prevent the global economy and and its outputs from affecting America. So it, the only way to to ameliorate the, the worst of what's coming is through international frameworks that get everybody to stop fucking putting this shit in the air. There's no fucking solution that's America only there. It, or any other individual country, because then they're just going to be competing with each other, which means every fucking drop of oil and natural gas is going to get pulled out of the earth and put into the atmosphere until we're fucking Venus. Uh, did I read a news article this week that parts of the Arctic are on fire at the moment? Yeah, that's fine. Whatever. The permafrost is melting. <laughs> no, unleashing. No, actually, that's good because the fire will sterilize all of the prehistoric diseases right. that are going to be belched <laughs> out of, from like, you know, some woolly mammoth asshole. Yeah, as, I love when they like, out. I love when you like you, you like are reading about um, like climate change and the things like rising sea levels. I mean, like they're obvious, but like, you know, extreme weather. But for the real heads when you start getting into disease, like that's when you're like, oh no, that's going to be the really cool one. Like that's going to be the end of days shit. It's like when we have new plagues just rolling across major continents. Well, uh, Dinosaur gonorrhea. <laughs> you clever girls. <laughs> um, uh, you win. <laughs> uh, Matt, though, I, I mean, I, I think you, you had the phrase that, that sums it up best. Fortress America. Yeah. Because that is where this is going. And that's what these people want to recreate. They want to recreate a fortress America, not just with them in charge politically, but with them in charge culturally. Because here's where he gets into it. He says, to rebuild our common purpose, we must protect our communities of faith because religious faith has fueled our history and shaped our aspirations and bettered our society. It is not the role of government to promote Christianity or any religion, but let us be clear. Our government should not hinder or diminish religious expression. We need strong religious communities active in civic life, protecting the vulnerable, defending the weak, because these communities have helped make us who we are as a people. Here's where, he, here's where it gets to the really schizophrenic and, and evil part of this. If he's talking about how uh, what we need of more of America are strong families, strong communities with strong religious ties, but also we need to kick out 
basically all immigrants, then you're shooting yourself in the foot. Because if you look at like the communities in America that are most religious, most tied to family, and their individual neighborhoods and communities, you're basically talking about immigrant communities. And there were other pe- speakers. Well, that and elite mega churches. Well, that's a, they would prefer that. Yeah, yeah. They would prefer that one. But like, you no, can't, that's that's their bread and butter. Yeah, you can't badmouth this supposed like you know cosmopolitanism of you know secular uh, liberal values or whatever. Yeah. And like, here's the thing: there was uh, there are other speakers at this conference, including a I think UPenn law professor named Amy Wax, who by the way, look her up. She looks like a Dick Tracy fucking villain, and you know sounds like one too. Uh, she basically said straight up that. America's immigration policy needs to favor uh, white Anglo or European immigrants over all others. And she said this wasn't based on race, but based on culture. And the idea that we should uh, prioritize immigrants who have a, quote, cultural affinity for America over ones that don't. And that will necessarily mean white immigrants over non-white immigrants. And I'm like, okay, if you're talking about immigration in America, basically you're basically talking about Mexico and Central America, which are overwhelmingly Christian countries who, despite the best interventions of this country, have an experience with democratic government and cult (laughs) society. Right? But also if you think about like the people that don't have an affection for whatever American values, like what, are we going to like keep out the French? (laughs) Yes. Well, I mean, what do they even mean? Like uh, they're they're really big fans of the fucking TGI app sampler. What the fuck is uh, affinity for American culture? But that's the thing is when they say American culture, they mean a white conservative Christian culture and not the American culture of like flat brim Marvel hat guys that actually exist. But those American Christians don't have culture either. There's no culture in the exurbs. There's no culture in the fucking mega churches. I mean, I would say like culture is, fills a vacuum. Um, it's just bad and incoherent and antisocial culture. I mean, like the suburbs have a culture. Like uh, you know, it's uh, been memeified a lot. It's just it's not um, it's not it's an antisocial culture. It's like a, an incoherent culture of of atomized people. Well, it's not produced actively. It's not collaborated upon. It's sort of like whatever people sort of suck up from media and kind of congeals in, in that geographic space. Um, Amy Wax also went on to talk about how when she talks about the cultural differences between, you know, real Americans and uh, immigrants from Mexico and Central America, she said uh, the problem with their culture is that they're too loud and they litter too much. <laughs> <laughs> so that that's the level we're talking about here. Everything that was said about every uh, European ethnic group when they exactly. Got here too. I mean, like, so language. I guess that's that's a barrier or whatever. But like, that was a barrier for fucking you know yeah. uh, Jewish immigrants from fucking Poland or Germany or or, or Italian. Yeah. How much cultural affinity with American with American culture did Irish and Italian immigrants who came here in huge numbers in the 18th and 19th centuries have? Not a whole nothing fucking in common lot. with all of these wasps. Yeah, yeah. They, 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 and and the wasp ruling class of that era was acutely aware of that and yeah. terrified of it. Yeah, mid nineteenth century they're wasps. They're loud said and they that litter. Was, exactly. Mid nineteenth century wasps. Children. Yeah. Mid nineteenth century wasps said that uh, that American democratic government was incompatible with Catholicism. <laughs> Not like that was a real thing. Uh, it was a uni- It was a. It was a widely held belief. It's what led to the know nothings being created, because right. the, the your allegiance Catholics to the don't, Vatican. Their allegiance is to some weirdo in Rome. It's yeah. not to uh, the American institution. And now half the fucking it's assholes making Moloch. these arguments are fucking Catholic. Uh, I just want to read one last thing here about the uh, National Conservatism Conference. Uh, this comes courtesy of uh, Osita uh, Wenevu writing in the New Yorker, a uh, friend of the show. I was going to read the last paragraph of his piece because, uh, you know, he covered this. And I think he uh, he sort of cuts to the heart of what's going on at this conference. And I think he says it better than I could. So he goes here. The tension between desiring a strong common national identity and respecting the integrity and independence of particular communities and families is resolved in national conservatism by the belief that the American nation ought to be uniformly composed of the same kinds of people. The conservative nation desired by the national conservatives will assist the parts so long as those parts are majority white, Christian, and naturally conservative. This will be a hard country to bring about despite the best efforts of the Trump administration. It's now commonplace to say that Trump's policies and rhetoric do not reflect who we are as a country. This is true not just as in a creedal or spiritual sense, but in a sheer demographic sense. The United States is irreversibly diverse. 
non-white American citizens will not be spirited out of the country by tweet or by incantation. The right may lash out at them in rhetoric or policy or violence, but nothing will create for conservatives a country of people mostly like themselves. The best they can hope for is that they might continue to govern a country filled with people they despise. Only time will tell whether national conservatism is a politically viable vehicle for doing so. And I think, I mean, I think that gets down to it. This is something we've spoken about time and time again on the show, is we find ourselves in a very weird place in which a hard right wing dominates all three branches of government due to the, but they're governing a population of people who are 70% completely out of their grasp. And you could go down issue by issue. Just take, do you want Roe v. Wade to be overturned? Super majorities of Americans do not want to see that happen. It's not going to stop them from doing it, if should they get a chance to. But, I mean, this is, this is the paradox that national conservatism is attempting to uh, address, which is that how do we create some kind of democratic legitimacy for, a country, for ruling a country that dis- we despise and despises us? And I, I am skeptical, actually, of um, sort of their ability to split. I think capitalism is sort of like too entrenched for them to have like a, a genuine sort of, um, you know, conservative movement that, um, has to at the very least kind of curtail some of the most horrible like aspects and inhumane sort of um, aspects of capitalism. I like I'm very skeptical of that, but nonetheless, I think it is definitely worth keeping an eye on because like the last kick of a dying donkey, especially like a, you know a conservative right wing uh, populist that donkey, classic Republican donkey. Yeah, <laughs> uh, like it. it I mean, it's it's very appealing. You can see it in other countries, too. I mean, like, whatever, the Tommy Robinson stuff in the UK. It was someone who's, like, a, just a fucking Nazi, <laughs> like, being like, look, uh, you know, the, the markets have been cruel to you, and people are getting, people are getting invested in it. it its ability to be effective is going to be very, very closely connected to the ability of the opposing party to articulate an actually incisive critique of capitalism if 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 the democratic party doubles down on the idea that actually capitalism is great because it gives you you know a uh, pride month uh, sponsored by bank of america then that's the only way that this totally incoherent hash of bullshit is going to be remotely credible to anybody uh i just want to go back to your last point will because it is something that i was thinking about last week and during last week's episode about like Donald Trump's the hate America thing. The thing that makes it particularly vile for me is and it was put into perspective by reading this because it's like you read through that and simmering through every line of somebody like Howley's speech is we hate America. We mm. hate the way it is currently composed. We hate the people of America. We hate their beliefs. Literally everyone who is not in our increasingly shrinking minority voting block mm. is evil and wrong and un-American and bad. And then their current lash out is that, no, 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 it's actually the Democrats who hate America. And I, obviously, we, hypocrisy is dead as a like, call out force, but it, is, it, it put that whole Trump and the squad thing into just such a harsh perspective to read these like seething with vile, venomous hatred for what America is lines from the current or, in the, or perhaps the future of the conservative movement. I'll say it again, and please keep it in mind as you encounter more and more of this bullshit, be it from Josh Howley, Tucker Carlson, J.D. Vance or any of these absolute fucking con artists, half of all Americans live in a city. Uh, and they work in the city, and they're as fucked over by these obscene concentration of wealth as anybody. Like, you keep talking, these guys love to talk about Silicon Valley and how unfair it is that it gets all of this money. It hasn't been great for the people who have to live and work in, the, in those areas. They're getting priced out of any kind of housing or any ability to live anywhere near any of their fucking jobs. So, uh, worth keeping an eye on. Uh, Felix, are you still there? Felix had to go. He was okay. Well, we lost Felix at some point uh, during this conversation, but um, he's got to move, got to prepare for the episode one show tonight. But uh, Matt and Amber, you uh, ably picked up the slack as always. So, uh, any uh, any closing, any other closing thoughts or plugs or anything? It's too hot. It's too fucking hot out. It's um, too hot. New York City, number one, number one <laughs> in the world, baby. <laughs> Um, and yeah, be on the lookout for, uh, Amber's book. Do you have a pub date on that yet? No. <laughs> well. <laughs> Sometime next year. Well, watch here for further <laughs> updates. 
Okay, guys. Till next time. Bye. Bye-bye.